Welcome back my Weld 2 family. My name is Jordan Moreno at that classy diver on Instagram. I'm an underwater welder and a commercial diver. And in today's episode, I've teamed up with WeldTube to show you underwater welding in the real world and commercial diving. So a little bit about me. I work for Phoenix International. We're based out of San Diego, California. Uh, I've been doing this for about seven years now. My company specializes in underwater welding, underwater construction, and ship's husbandry. All right, so here we go. We got our pad ice here that we'll be welding uh, in the wet. Uh, it is roughly around 12 inches uh, wide by 13 inches tall, about inch and a half thick. Uh, if you get a little bit closer, you can see we scribe a line here that'll give us our fillet leg length. We're looking for a 5 8 fillet weld on these. This is uh, it's about 45 pounds, so pretty big. Pretty big pad eye. Uh, we got two of these big boys to put in. We got two smaller handling pad eyes. We call these our shaft handling pad eyes. They'll be lifting roughly around 95,000 to 100,000 pounds with a 25 ton hydraulic hoist on them. So these will be going in uh, hopefully today or tomorrow. Yeah, so this is the dive shack. Uh, that's our diving supervisor. This is where we control the diver's air video and light. Uh, we keep a video on the divers to monitor at all times. Yeah, this is uh, us going ahead and uh, gonna go get to work here. Our tenders are uh, checking us out, making sure all of our uh, hats are cammed up properly and nothing's gonna come off in the water and uh, go through our safety checks. Uh, it's gonna go ahead and uh, go, get, go ahead and get to work there. And this is actually the well test we have to do in the water every time we do this. So while we're doing the job, each each and every single welder diver gonna be welding on this project has to do a test every single time, every job. So what we do is a 3F and a 4F fillet weld, a single pass, and then every time they're gonna, we're gonna send it up to service and they're gonna break it and check the penetration profile, check for porosity, any undercut, any spatter on the plate, um, you know, any discontinuities that are gonna fail it. And if you fail, you gotta retest. After two fails, you gotta requalify. So they, they do this in, in a lot of other fields, you know, in the in running a pipeline, chasing the pipeline, these guys, they do all that stuff too. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of similarities in, in all types of welding. So maybe something not a lot of people knew, but yeah, we, we have to test every job. Everybody dreads the test. We don't like it, but you got to do it. And it is inspected by an inspector every time too. So they're always out to get you. And that's where the proper workmanship comes into place. So yeah, I mean, these plates can be really hard sometimes, you know, there's a lot of magnetism in them sometimes from grinding them and uh, it can just be nerve wracking, but Sometimes you just gotta stick through them. Yeah, so here we are. We're just gonna be uh, getting ready to uh, fit up this pad eye on here. Um, we had already prepped the area and laid out for it already. And um, this pad eye is pretty big. It's about 50 pounds, 45 pounds. So I'm gonna need a hand uh, from my buddy there to go ahead and just hold it up. Okay, there's some. Sometimes you have like a tool that'll help you hold it up there, but we just decided to go with the old school, uh, hey there bud, go ahead and hold that up there and we put a tack on it, trick. It worked out pretty well for us. Uh, we had already beveled this pad eye. These ships, they're kind of shaped like a U, so you have to account for that on these pad eyes to make sure that they, uh, they fit up without having any gaps. So we went ahead and beveled, uh, might've been like a 20 degree bevel or something like that on there. Yeah, so I just like to always take a look at everything before I call it fit up, you know, make sure there's nothing I'm missing. Um, if I need to take it off and do a little grinding, I will. This one, uh, this one looked really good, so we just went ahead with it. I'm probably go ahead and I'll just be cleaning up these tacks here in a little bit, um, getting it ready for a fit up verification video, which is that something we do on anything that we fit up onto a ship or anything welding in the wet. We always do a 
set up verification video. That's what top side and our client can see that, you know, we're we're within spec on uh, on everything that we're doing. Uh, right here, I got the uh, angle finder on that, just making sure that we're 90 coming off the ship, straight up and down. We got a lot of weight that's gonna be, a lot of stress and weight that's gonna be put on these pad eyes, so we just wanna make sure everything's right. If you have it at a funny angle or, or anything like that, you, you, ha you have a chance of possibly fracturing that pie, side loading, it's not made to be, be like that. It's made to be uh, pulled from a straight up and down. So it's really important to make sure that it's fit up correctly. Yeah, so like I said, just cleaning up these tacks here, getting ready for that video. Uh, here it is, really nice fit up, you know, uh, no gaps at all really. Um, that's what's gonna make you have a lot, a lot better of a time welding this thing out. Uh, fit up is everything. As uh, any seasoned welder would know, a bad fit up is gonna give you a heartache all day long. So go ahead and make it right. Make it, make sure it's right the first time. Take your time with it. It's really, really important. Well, so after that, uh, after the top side go ahead and gives me the go ahead, they like it. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start putting in that root. Uh, we'll be running it somewhere around anywhere from the 80 to 95 amps. Uh, all just kind of depends how it's welded. There's a lot of magnetism in these ships that we gotta deal with. So sometimes you gotta jump around a little bit and uh, kind of endure the suck of it, but uh, we'll get that root in there. So what you see where I'm clipping off to there, uh, that's, I don't know who really invented it or whether my company invented it or who else uses it. Um, but it's called a magnet chair. That's what we call it, a magnet chair. It's basically a thousand pound lifting magnet. Same thing you'd use to lift a sheet of steel in the shop. Uh, and we mount that to a, like an aluminum chair that we make. And uh, we put some buoyancy on it so we can uh, kind of float it around where we need it. And we just stick it to the ship there and we're able to uh, weld wherever we need to without having to weld staging on or anything. We can just put that sucker there and we're good to go. The type of rod I'll be using uh, at this particular moment is a 332 nickel rod. It is for high carbon steels. Anything 0 0.40 and above is what we will be using these uh, nickel rods on. Um, we use the nickel rod uh, when we don't really know exactly the carbon content, what's in there, if we can't get a metal sample, or if we know it is a high carbon, uh, such as a HY80, HSLA80, HSLA100, anything like that, we'll be using these types of rods on. Um, with regular mild steel rods, uh, they're really susceptible to hydrogen-induced cracking. These rods, not so much, so that's another reason why we'll be using these. We run this uh, direct current electrode positive um, for this particular rod, we do that, um, we get a better penetration profile, a thicker throat. Also when welding with just a regular old, uh, underwater mild steel rod, hydro weld, broco, something like that. Um, you can use direct current electrode positive or electrode negative. Uh, they each have their place. Uh, electrode positive is gonna give you a higher penetration profile, a little bit thicker in the throat. Electrode negative is gonna be uh, a little bit less penetration, but it's gonna be a very flat, almost concave bead. Uh, and that's okay sometimes, you know, it just depends on the application you're using it. For us, we, we run electrode positive. Some people run electrode negative. Uh, I think they're, I think they're both good. They, they both serve their purpose. So you can see I'm starting on the inside of this pad eye where the angle is the greatest, meaning like it's in, uh, it's an acute angle right there. So, um, I do that because you, when, when wet welding, you always want to start at the lowest point on an object. And that is because of where your bubbles go and where the steam will go. Basically, when you have those two pieces against each other, there you got the pad eye and the ship hole, uh, you, you, you're, you're basically boiling the water behind that. So you are 
creating steam and that steam will blow out on you. So if you welded the outside of that pot eye first and the sides and then went on to the inside to weld it, which is the lowest point, your, your bubbles and your steam are gonna go up, hit the back of that other weld and come right back at you, kind of just blow out on you. And you really don't want that, especially on your root. That, the root is the most important part uh, of any weld. So you always wanna start from the, uh, the lowest point. We use uh, hydraulic tools underwater. You can use pneumatics. We prefer to use hydraulics. Uh, it doesn't create bubbles so you can see what you're grinding on. Uh, we use hydraulic four inch grinders, hydraulic nine inch grinders, hydraulic die grinders, and we use hydraulic skill saws for like cutting things off or cutting inserts and, and uh, large cuts we gotta make. We'll use the, uh, the skill saw. The technique for uh, that we use for welding uh, in the wet is stringer bead technique, always. We never use a weave type technique. You'll see me putting the rods to the grind to the grinder there, and that's just taking off that, that uh, first layer of uh, basically uh, underwater coating that goes on the rod. If you try to light off, and uh, it's not gonna light off with that coating on it, so you gotta just go ahead and, and uh, take that tip off there. You can do it with a grinder or a knife. Yeah, so now it looks like I'm moving to the outside of the pad eye. Oh, that'll be the uh, the last part I'll do to call that root finished. Is uh, always always that outside uh, joint there. Once I'm done with uh, the root, we'll go ahead and do a uh, what's called a root video. Um, that's just a verification for top side to uh, double check that we're not trying to cover up any uh, any discontinuities or anything like that. So. And then once we do the uh, root, we'll go ahead and go to the uh, hot pass, hot pass, fill layer. Fill layers cover. I can't remember exactly how many layers it took to do this pad eye here. Uh, maybe eight or something uh, fill layers to get that 5 eighths fillet weld, uh, what we're trying to get. When underwater welding, we use the uh, same glass lens that you would use top side. Uh, I use a shade eight glass. That's um, that's what I like to use. Some people like to use a nine. Just kind of depends on how their eyes are. Um, but I like to use an eight. Some people use a gold nine. They don't make a gold eight. I'd really like to have that. If anybody can find that, please let me know. Yeah. So when underwater welding, we always use direct uh, direct current. We never use an AC current. Um, never ever use AC current in the water. So. Yeah, and obviously, you know, all of our machines are uh, obviously topside. We run uh, welding leads uh, four out down into the wet there, and um, topside controls all the welding machines up there. We always have direct communications uh, via our diving umbilical there um, to topside, so we can always, hey, we, we want to come up on our amps, we want to come down, you know. You know, and then that being said, you know, with the communications, uh, safety is always number one. Um, before before ever getting in the water, you know, you always have what we call a toolbox talk or safety meeting. Uh, talk about any any hazards that might be present. Um, if anybody doesn't understand exactly what the task at hand is, we can talk about it then, make sure everyone knows what's going on. Um, when setting yourself up underwater to uh, weld and to work, you know, it's really important to you know where all your tools are at, all the lines coming in the water, your umbilical, make sure you're not wrapped around something down there. You, you never know when um, something might happen that you got to uh, call for help or you might have to go help somebody. So you have to really make sure you really uh, understand your surroundings. Also, number the second most important thing is having a good crew of guys, you know, we're really fortunate. We've got a, we've got a great crew, work for a great company. Uh, training's really good. Everybody knows the task at hand, what we got to do. So it really gives you a good, comfortable feeling in the water. You're not worried about what's going on up top side. If anything's going to happen, you know, you, you, you can really focus on your job and that really helps with uh, creating a good product for the uh, customer that hires you. Our crew consists of uh, usually a supervisor, four welder divers, 
maybe an inspection diver or two and uh, at least two tenders. Um, the tender's job is really to take care of all the equipment. Um, divers as well, we also help out with the equipment, but and to just make sure the deck is squared away and the divers get in the water safely and out of the water safely. And you can just see just, you know, periodically going ahead and grinding my starts and stops. That's all important. The same uh, workmanship you'd use topside is the same we're gonna use underwater. Um, it's all really important to take pride in your work. You never know, you know, they might call my dive short right now because something's going on. I gotta get out of the water for a little bit and then my dive will be up. Next guy comes down and you left them a mess. Nobody's gonna like that. So always make sure you work as if, um, you know, you're leaving it for somebody else the way you would wanna find it. It's a good, uh, good rule of thumb there. Yeah, I've got some really cool shots on this uh, video here. I can't wait to see what we've got coming up on video number two. Some people might have a question about, you know, being electrocuted underwater. Does it happen? How does it feel? Yes, it happens. It happens all the time. <laughs>